My experience of orthodoxy and orthodox Christianity, orthodox spirituality, has been a huge influence since about 2017 in my life, but earlier than that as well. Um, coming into contact with it with YouTube and, and the likes before actually setting foot in an Orthodox monastery and then trying to bed in in the Orthodox par various Orthodox parishes that were uh, in some way, shape or form local to me and having to n negotiate, you know, lockdowns and all the rest of it. I'm not here to get the fiddle out um, and, and play, it, play a tune of lament. Um, get the violin out, as it were. I'm here to talk about monasticism. Do we exaggerate monasticism a wee bit too much in orthodoxy? Like it's the gold standard, like it's the the Nova Mass, as they'd say in Spanish, the, 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 the non plus ultra. I think we do, definitely. Today I spent a couple of hours in this book, The Reformation, um, as renewal. And this book is Retrieving the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. This is the idea that the reformers indeed were not um, innovators, but rather seeking to recover a lost uh, apostolic church, um, uh, biblical church. Semper reformanda, because obviously uh, it's a task that needs to be going on in every generation because we humans love to to add um, our rituals and add our rites and then make them um, make them mandatory, make them obligatory. The first section of this book, and it's a it's a brick of a book. The first section of this book is gonna is gonna is gonna look at the history of this, the Scala Dei, the ascent to God. Um, of course, there are two major movements um, in in Christianity. There's the descent of God to to humanity in Christ, the incarnation. But there's there's also this 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 development of the the ascent, the mystical ascent to God, and this happens early doors in Christianity, from around the time of Constantine, the author. Um, states um, with with lots and lots of citations and examples when just after Constantine is at Theodosius Christianity becomes the official religion of the empire now martyrdom's not available it's been championed as the as the be-all and end-all of Christian life to be prepared to die to take up one's cross and follow Christ it's not available anymore people start looking for a white martyrdom, a um, martyrdom of virginity, of celibacy, of desert, a fugus mundi, a retreat into the desert from the Christianizing empire. I suppose these gents rather than feel, look, let's go out and be salt and light and really get the word out to the empire. And let's just be a retreat. And we see this development of mysticism, of going within to conquer the demons which lurk in the heart, to overcome the passions, and to work our way into heaven, albeit through prayer and the grace of God, but to climb that slippery slope upwards. Um, it's a far cry from Ephesians 2, which says, you know, Christ has seated us in the heavenly places, but we are citizens of heaven already. And it has major implications, because obviously if this is what it's all about, then, and loads of authors are writing about it, everyone from, you know, Athanasius and, and St. Anthony of the Desert, um, probably through Athanasius, all the way to, you know, Benedict and, the, and his Benedictine rule, all the, lots and lots of the Eastern Fathers. And then you've got the medieval times of uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the Cistercians, 
the Carthusians. They all talk about this, the various stages of the climb to God, to union with God. And this was very much my life in religious life as a Roman Catholic in a very fervent order. And in this dynamic, of course, you know, the, the monks are seen to be the real McCoy. Uh, and I see this definitely in orthodoxy, more so than in Catholicism. Um, I would I would say, from my experience, The Angelic Life is the name of this book. It's a good book about um, orthodox monasticism. I'm not a brick of a book, which I'm not here to review, but, um, you know, that, that, that became became the term that the monks were um were human angels um living the angelic life in their human bodies and their human existence well matthew barrett takes us on a on a whistle stop tour in the first 50 odd pages of this scala day um and the rise of monastic theology before he's going to do the same with scholasticism and he's going to show that they're not two separate traditions they were often um, united particularly in the west to a greater or lesser extent he arrives at the imitatio christi the imitation of christ by saint thomas a Kemp, or he's thomas a Kempis one of the most uh, famous books in Catholic piety. And it's all about the, you know, the the retreat into the desert, the isolation from the world, um, imitating Christ, of course. Um, although Christ didn't retreat into the desert for very long, he was an active man of, uh, of God, of course, the son of God, he came into the world, ate and drank with sinners, and surprised everyone and the the Pharisees thought he was a glutton and a wine bibber. I really like this little section here. He's talking about the difference between the emerging Luther and this Thomas Aqu Thomas Akempis pietism that he would have been exposed to as a monk. You know, five, six hundred five hundred years on, I was in the Commodore every morning. The dining room every morning fasting most days whilst this was being read a chapter from thomas a Kempis every single day and he would have had the same well thomas a Kempis explain he's going to compare and contrast the two and i think it's just so refreshing whereas thomas a Kempis says look get away from the world don't get involved in its ephemeral joys or concern yourselves with the affairs of the world, and then what great peace and tranquility will be ours if we have severed ourselves from useless preoccupations and put our trust in God, and thought only of divine things and of our salvation. This is the Fugus Mundi par excellence, isn't it? Well, Luther disagreed, you see here, and um, he says, enter the world. He said to the average layman, with every confidence that your vocation from farmer to clerk to nursing mother, from teacher to doctor, from working in a warehouse to packing shelves in a supermarket is not some useless preoccupation, but just, and get this, but just as worthy of God's pleasure and just as useful in God's kingdom as the priest in the cathedral or the monk in the monastery. As Luther said in 1521, monastic vows are no better than working on a farm or any other kind of manual work. I think I'll make that the title of this video. It'll be very provocative, but I, and, you know, a few times when I, you know, I've gotten really into this orth orthodoxy, you know, really got serious about it i just want to get back to the monastic life and i don't know where that's coming from i'm a married man um now and have been for years and um my wife is nothing but a blessing in my life she's not no enemy she's a woman of prayer and of god it's not correct uh, that's my own personal thing 
But I wonder how many Orthodox people seem to think that the be-all and end-all and only way to accomplish their um, desires to be full-on Christians, committed Christians, true followers of Christ is 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 that the guy's doing this 24-7, the Scala Day. And, you know, I think it was the refreshing um, bolt-on, if you like, the refreshing revision of the Reformation is to remind us, no, you're already seated in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 1. That Christ has already attained victory. If we look at this as well, you know, this is Revelation, the book of Revelation 1 um, and verse 5 and onwards. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, not by ours, and made us a kingdom, has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. We are all priests. We're all called to offer up intercession for the world a priesthood of all believers bringing forth intercession everywhere we're planted everywhere we are this is the radicality of christ there are desert monks trying to be forgiven you're already forgiven by the blood of jesus do you believe it do you take hold of it by faith there are people sweating away in seminaries like i used to waiting to, hoping to, waiting, praying, hoping to be ordained as priests, to keep in with the right people, to say the right things, don't rock the boat. They're already priests to God, their God. Jesus is God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. You know, the world may be a rocky place to be in, especially nowadays, but Jesus is the, the firstborn of the dead here, the ruler of the kings on earth, the ruler of the kings on earth. We can have victory through him, and we're called to offer victorious prayer to God through him, in him, and with him. This guy here, Reese Howells, phenomenal. There's a book written by Norman Grubb, Intercessor, um, or Intercession, Intercessor, I think. This guy, a coal miner, left school at 12, started work at 12, when legally at those days you could only start at 13. Worked 12 hours a day. For, you know, the, these were in the days, in the in the late 1800s um, when people didn't have TV sets and the likes and they would sing at home, you know, songs of piety and, and hymns and read their Bible. And into that mix, he, he meets all kinds of revivalists and he becomes a true man of God and his intercession becomes all powerful with God. And he brings... It was so many radical, beautiful graces are poured out for the people he prays for, for the movements that, that start up rather organically through this great intercessory prayer. Reading about him really changed my outlook on my own work, that I started to see it more as a ministry rather than, oh, I'm just whiling away the time before I can inevitably get to somewhere like Athos and... Uh, escape the madness it's helped me to rather see this is my athos this is my cross i need no other <laughs> it's a far bigger cross for me to be in the world a world that's so paganized that's is nothing short of babylon in the modern world and to love the people with the love that god gives me to pray for them insistently and systematically writing them in my prayer book and offering them to God daily. This is a real ministry and it's one I'm sure the Lord is happy with and, and finds blessed. So I'll just return to that idea. It's a question mark. It's something I think we, we ignore 
in orthodoxy too much that we we often think oh the real christians you know they're the priests and they're the monks and but you know having been a monk myself i can honestly say and you know, you know it's a, often it's a far tougher gig being out in the world absolutely it is because of all the forces stacked against you in a very tangible and real way not just in a spiritual sense if i can use the word just forgive me there but you know what i mean you know there's so much to admire about the orthodox liturgical system its spirituality and all the rest of it it's fitting it's worthy it's it's beautiful it's solemn it's everything you would expect from those committed to serve the lord but this you know, I just see the beauty in other traditions, too. As Luther said in 1521, monastic vows are no better than working on a farm or any other kind of manual labor. Enter the world, he said, to the average layman, to the average person, with every confidence that your vocation from farmer to clerk to nursing mother is is not some useless preoccupation but just as worthy just as worthy of god's pleasure and just as useful in god's kingdom as the priest in the cathedral or the monk in the monastery you know in orthodoxy i see so much deference made to the priests fair enough fair enough Balancing that with humility must be a delicate task, a task of grace. I see the, the, the usefulness of it to an extent, kissing the hand of the priest and his blessings and, and great deference or learning, seeking to learn from your spiritual father almost exclusively for some, like almost like they were monks. But at the same time, what does the scripture say is salute one another with the kiss of peace. Are we not all vessels of Christ? Are we not all temples of the Holy Spirit? It's fruit for thought, isn't it? God bless your prayers.